welcome everyone. Uh, welcome to this online community meetup, uh, Democratize, Decolonize, Participate, an Approach to Future Literacy. Uh, I'm Maxime Laprade, I'm a community gardener at the We Are Museum online community. This is an online uh, meetup organized by We Are Museum and hosted by the We Are Museum online community. You're all from the community, so you know what it is, but it's a space where all the members can share ideas, comment and react to the ideas of others. So please, if you have anything that you want to share on the community, feel free to do it. Uh, this uh, meetup is part of a program called Museum Facing Extinction Lithuania uh, that gathers 16 museum professionals working in different institutions in Lithuania. And they are working together to find solutions to fight the climate crisis and start the ecological transition together. Part of this program is to meet experts, and today we are meeting experts of uh, future literacy, uh, and we are going to talk about how public institutions have an opportunity to provide new meeting places and to become community platforms that amplify public opinion and transform their audiences into co-creating participants, participants challenging the inadequate imaginary of what it means to be human in the 21st century and beyond. Uh, we have two guests. Uh, the first guest uh, and who is going to lead the session today is Nicholas Larsen. Hello, everyone. Nicholas Larsen is a senior advisor and head of <laughs> initiative at the Copenhagen Institute for Future Studies, which is an independent and nonprofit future think tank working to equip and inspire individuals and organizations, decision makers and the public to act on the future today. Uh, he's going to tell you a lot more about this um, during his presentation and he's going to welcome next Catherine Pedersen, who is an head of education at Arken Museum of Modern Art. Uh, Catherine holds an MA in Art and Humanities from Copenhagen University, Department of, Department of Media, Cognition and Communication. Her expertise in language, argumentation and digital culture informs her unique perspective. She is a frequent media commentator co-editor of New York magazine Pan and the Dream, founder of Loopland and of the humansituation.org. And in addition to this, she writes articles about art, culture, and digital culture, and has been associated partner at Copenhagen Institute for Future Studies since 2012. So the session today is going to be participatory, and we're going to have different formats. First, uh, Nicholas is going to do a presentation about uh, future studies, uh, then a short Q&A. Then he We'll discuss uh, with Catherine Pedersen, who is going to present something. It's going to be Oi. a discussion between the two, uh, then a short Q&A. And then the third format will be a workshop in breakout rooms so we all uh, can participate and build something together. Uh, and then we'll conclude. Uh, just before starting, let me remind you that the session is being recorded and uh, that it will be posted online after. And use the chat, uh, participate if you have questions, don't hesitate. Uh, and uh, right now we can just start. Thank you very much for joining us. And Nicholas, you have the mic, you can, you can go. Thank you so much, Maxime. Just give me 10 seconds and I'll share my screen. Do you see it? Yeah, all good. Great. Well, first of all, thank you for having me here. I'm very honored to be here at this meetup hosted and planned by the uh, the We Are Museums community. I've maybe met some of you at the uh, Museums Going Extinct conference back in November, um, but I'm very happy and excited to be back again. And it was a very uh, thorough introduction you gave Maxime, so I'm gonna spare us a little bit, but what we're gonna talk about today is essentially how museums can facilitate broader participation in future thinking. Um, very briefly about myself, I'm Nicholas, as you know by now, I am from the Copenhagen Institute for Future Studies, founded 50 years ago, one of the oldest think tanks in the world devoted to, uh, to studying the future. Um, I'm an integral part of the Institute's interface towards the public. I am responsible for many of our happenings and collaborations and partnerships with educational and cultural institutions. You may have heard about Futures Literacy, and there was this big summit just happening where I was a curator aiding UNESCO in gathering content uh, from the different exhibitors. I'm a part of the uh, Future-Oriented Museum Synergies Network where I was so lucky to meet Diane that kindly asked me to come here today. And I am a writer of scenario where I have my own format called Applied Futurism, where I talk to pioneers in the field on how the future can be a source for 
sustainable development, hope, and social innovation. Very briefly, an agenda for today. We're gonna to do a quick check-in and then I'm gonna do this presentation that I've chosen to call Democratize, Decolonize and Participate, which are three different developments that are intertwined, but nevertheless developments in the, uh, in the futures world and in future studies and in foresight. Um, then we're gonna feature our special guest, Katrine Pedersen, who is a colleague and partner and a dear friend of mine doing amazing stuff at the prominent museum uh, called Aachen Museum of Modern Art here just outside of Copenhagen. Um, then we're gonna take some of all these ideas that we have been discussing and go into breakout groups and discuss some questions that we will bring back in a plenary session before we close out with a takeaway. Um, so first of all, now as we slowly about to dive into 1.5 hours headfirst into the future, I wanna ask you what comes to mind when you think about the future. You can say it out loud if you want, you can use the chat. It can be one word, it could be a sentence, it could be a thought or a feeling. What comes to mind? What do you feel when you think about the future right now? Just take a minute and, let, and let's use this moment to check in and declare what the future means to us. Time perspective, cycles, stainless steel coated, post COVID, uncertainty. Okay, so all things that I'm getting in the chat here. More innovation. All these things are uh, different aspects and they, there's more green thinking coming in, possibilities, travel. Okay, I was a little too fast here, great. All these things are different aspects that exemplifies how we use the future all the time, both consciously and subconsciously for many different things. And that's what we are about to discuss and explore a little bit. And I just wanna mention the last one here. My dreams are realized and I am happy. That's a great way to think about the future. The future itself is a domain of study and work and it's developing very quickly these days for several reasons. The current pandemic and the perceived heightened uncertainty in the world right now being the main ones. You've probably all seen a lot of scenarios and trend reports recently. Um, and that's because we all seek to understand the so-called new normal and how life might look like on the other side of the pandemic. Another aspect is that this year, 2020, has revealed a lot of deep systemic inequalities for us and a lot of flaws in society. It, had, it has somehow created more room for us to imagine differently, think about other futures ahead than the current mainstream ones that we are experiencing. What I'm trying to state here is that there's a clear and renewed interest in the future on very many levels. And museums has a chance to use this as a springboard. There is momentum and we're gonna talk about that today, but first a brief intro to future studies. And this is a very popular tool to, uh, to exemplify how future studies are not trying to predict the future, but investigate alternative futures systematically. This is the cone of possibilities and it's a tool we use in future studies to help depict the idea that there are many possible futures ahead of us. As you can see, we are at the left side in the now and towards the right, we have the time and the cone is expanding with wildcards and scenarios. And then on the right side, you have possible, plausible, probable, and preferable futures. This is a possible, uh, sorry, this is a popular way of visualizing how we can examine different futures to understand how to make better decisions in the present. Humans have always been imagining alternative futures and attempted to anticipate what's to come. There's a renowned futurist called Wendy Schultz that have divided the history of futures into five waves of development, where the first wave is the oral traditions. Here we have shamans, the mystics, priests, read sign in nature and the divine to anticipate the future, very religiously connotated. And then we have the second wave, which is the early written age. Here, historians and macro historians are trying to look for patterns in the past to identify cycles of repetition. And then we have the third wave, 
which is the early written age. Um, sorry, this is the in, in wave of enlightenment and extraction. Here, the idea of progress is born through science. And then we have the fourth wave, um, which is systems and cybernetics. Here, industrialized war accelerates experiments within futures and technical forecasting uh, to either rebuild society as we did in Europe or to plan for future wars as, we, as the military used it in the US. This is where the future emerges as a discipline. And here uh, we are today in the fifth wave, which is the age of complexity and emergence. This is where the future and future theory are emerging with a lot of other disciplines, and it's slowly moving away from its very westernized origins. Um, and that's why we are gonna look at decolonizing the future. Now you might ask, how has the future been colonized in the first place? And there's many aspects to it. A few of them um, uh, around museums concerns, of course, artifacts on exhibit from other nations. There's also the top-down decisions on what is being put on display that are creating images of the future in the minds of the visitors. From a future studies perspective, foresight practitioners, often very tacit, uh, get to reproduce some of the dominant ideas and value systems through an often unintentional but constant lens. An examination done in the 90s found that the practice of future studies was westerly dominated and often uh, on the, at the cost of non-Western cultures and societies. It was argued in this study that both wittingly and non-wittingly, an elite of white male scholars were being promoted, not just to the exclusion of non-Western writers and thinkers on the future, but to the almost total exclusion of women and mar marginalized groups in creation of futures and images of the future. So if we try to deconstruct what decolonization means in terms of futures, um, we can look at it in this way, because it's not just a, uh, an abstract concept. It's a very powerful call to action uh, where we need to have awareness of our conscious and our subconscious reproduction of dominant ideas and value systems through unintentional but constant Western, male, white, more of the same lenses. We also need to acknowledge and make space for non-Western and marginalized worldviews, practice and knowledge production. Essentially, it's about widening the lenses and changing the practice of how the future is being conveyed and created in the minds of people. Um, and we can start by challenging the dominant images of the future. Um, because the images of the future in present day are often very dystopian images. Um, and we need to challenge them in order to foster new ideas, narratives, hopes, and fears. Um, let's look at some of these very dominant images of the future, um, which could also be described as poverty of the imagination. If we look at time, we can see uh, in the Western world very much uh, so that time is conceptualized as a very linear thing. And it's hard for us to even fathom that there are other constructs uh, constructs of time, such as a cyclical process in, uh, in native communities, for instance, where time, uh, where, where, where time um, in, in the form of past, present, and future are coexisting. On the right, we have images of anthropocentric narratives that tends to put humanity at the center of the universe with the planet at, uh, at our disposal, um, making us humans the central and superior species. There is the implicit concepts of short-term thinking and growth and progress in futures thinking. I'm not sure what it will take us to actually uh, adopt native phenomena of planning six to seven generations ahead, for instance, like indigenous people are doing. We can also look at the uh, pictures of food when we plan on colonizing Mars. Here we often see that it looks like we're gonna bring our traditional greenhouse with us, totally discrediting discrediting the many innovations in food and nutrition. And then there's all the images that singularly foregrounds technology as a centerpiece. And you can think about Black Mirror dystopian narratives that colonizes our minds. And if you, think, if you look at the last one, the future of cities. 
A simple Google search gets you nothing but sci-fi looking high rises, flying cars, steel and glass, very much like one of you um, wrote in the chat when you thought about the future. Why aren't we getting results of more sustainable, affordable housing models um, when we search for this? When we think about the future, we tend to extrapolate current knowledge, especially around technology and technological progression. It's much easier for us to grasp and imagine, um, but it leads to a very dangerously and narrow window of imagination where technology tends to, tends to be at the center rather than being a tool for us to achieve our aspirations. So we need to identify and challenge domin dominant or hegemonic futures. Dominant images of the future often becomes official futures. They often total discredit and delegitimize other futures. And it's a problem because unchallenged futures tend to perpetuate problems of the past. We need to make compelling and competing images of different futures as they can force power to respond. And I want to put uh, and I want to highlight one of my heroes in future studies here, Pupu Bisht, who is uh, founder of the Decolonizing Futures Initiative. And she's saying that if we want to build better futures, there we go, then I can see it. If we want to build better futures, leaving no one behind, then it means that we are totally dedicated to accepting that futures for all cannot be imagined by a few. It is not just about inclusion, it's about recognizing where power is held, because at the end of the day, decolonizing futures means to make room for marginalized worldviews and historically marginalized cultural identities in futures work. If we look at the next uh, element uh, in this presentation, it is democratizing futures. We're starting to see a greater push towards more inclusive and democratic approaches to tackle some of these issues. For example, the EU is currently discussing who should lead the new citizen inclusive project, the conference on the future of Europe um, to get citizen involved in wide ranging debate on Europe's future. There are great examples of futures projects that include uh, that, that has broader involvement. However, it, uh, future studies and futures thinking in general as a field still remains largely restricted to expert thinkers, professionals, and high level stakeholders that are hiring the futurists. We need more participation. That's what we argue in democratizing futures. We need to invite more people in and foster the capabilities. And as such, participatory futures projects is the combination of public engagement and futures work, as you can see on the illustration here. Um, and these projects can be used to galvanize public imagination and foster agency uh, and collective action towards aspired public futures. It's essentially about going from ideology and fiction towards social engagements. And some of the projects count participatory, participatory budgeting where citizens are involved in how public funds are being spent for social good. There's a 1970s Hawaii where the island state uh, tried to survey how the island, uh, how, the, how, the, how the state should look in year 2000. It was a two year long project with a lot of, lot of Hawaiian people included. And then there are more recently uh, EU projects that invited citizens to articulate visions on desirable and sustainable futures to inform innovation and research in, in, in the um, roadmap of the future of Europe. Another element of democratizing is teaching and learning next generations how to engage with futures systematically. There is an increasing amount of pedagogical and academic programs around the world that, that are doing this. And there are initiatives to increase the familiarity with the long term. It's about these new and open forms of teaching and learning that are emerging. We're essentially going for, uh, from a very uh, framed and uh, from, from very hard to say framed replication of the 20th century and the more industrial mindset of education to more open forms of teaching where we are stretching the imaginations in more open learning environments where there's not necessarily anything wrong or right when we talk about the future because the future does not exist and no one can predict it it only exists in our imagination hence we need these more open environments 
to reflect. Um, and it essentially, as the last point says here on this slide, it's about using the future as an open space or a safe space with room for differences to address dilemmas, foster agency values and belief systems. To engage more people in participatory futures, we need to engage them in, in futures thinking as well. And this is where we can take the UNESCO developed futures literacy capability in, uh, into account. It's a capability approach to futures, which means that you can train it and you can get better at it. Like other literacies, reading, writing, financial literacy, and so forth, it acknowledges that engaging with futures can and should be trained uh, so we can overcome what is uh, described as poverty of the imagination. It is about how we use the future. And there are these three anticipatory systems for doing so. The first one being planning for optimization, which means to develop or improve existing systems or practices, whether it be your wedding, your working from home setup, your life during lockdown, or your company's uh, or museum's COVID-19 strategy. The second one is preparing for contingency, which means to ready ourselves or yourself for something that might happen. The goal here is not to optimize, but to be more prepared for something uh, when it occurs or emerging phenomena. These are the first two, and they are called anticipation for the future. And this is where we are using most of our, um, of our futures thinking. The third one is called being open to emerging novelty. And that, it mean, that means engaging with futures that we not necessarily can make sense of yet because we have not seen them before. This includes exploring new system and new needs that we have not imagined yet. This is obviously more difficult, but it's equally important. Um, and all these three are, are, there's not one that's better than the other, but what, as UNESCO put it, we need to be able to walk on two legs in order to make the most of our futures thinking. Um, to stimulate futures literacy as a capability, we can take participants through a three-phase learning curve. The first phase reveals the implicit preferences and expectations that participants have about the future. The second phase reframes the participants' assumptions by confronting them with an imaginary future scenario, like we did in the uh, Museums Facing Extinction Conference, where we made a reframe that took the, cur uh, the curation power, the curation responsibility away from its traditional holders and put it out um, in a more inclusive process, just to be able to try to think differently around how things are being put on display in museums. Reframes are made so we can reach, to the, th uh, reach the third stage in this learning journey, where we need to rethink and reformulate our perspectives so we can ask new questions about the future. Playing with hopes and fears can allow you to become aware of these assumptions, these anticipatory assumptions that you make about the future. Here you can think about the future of museums, for instance. What do you expect versus what do you hope? And just ask yourself quietly uh, this question. Maybe you're able to see certain assumptions about the future that you, and you could potentially realize things that you were taking for granted. Essentially, this little gap analysis can help us open up for more, uh, to, to, to help us be more uh, spontaneous and open for other possibilities. We need futures to come out in the open, so, so to say, to foster new inspiration, narratives and ideas, to fuel the democratic debate, to provide sense of agency, desire and belonging. And museums have an incredible opportunity to decentralize the future in that way. They can do so by transforming the audience into participants, to foster new and alternative collective material of how we think about the future, to enable new and publicly shared images of the future, and welcome the individual to challenge boundaries and identify seats of change. It's time that we look at uncertainty as a feature, a permanent feature of our society and not a bug. A lot of futures work, especially in the corporate setting, has been occupied with trying to tame uncertainty, reduce uncertainty and get rid of it so we can secure continuity rather than embracing it and understand that it can actually be a resource for us. 
And we need to give people these spaces where they can come and understand and create the future for themselves in their communities. And as an end, I wanna quote a famous guy called Einstein, as you may know, as he says, the world as we have created it is a process of our thinking. It cannot be changed without changing our thinking. So that was my presentation for the first part of this meetup called Democratize, Decolonize and Participate. We now Thank open you very much, questions. Nicholas. Yeah, so we're going to have a few minutes for Q&A if anybody has a question. I have one question, if we can uh, start with this. Uh, uh, first, very general, do you have, uh, I know that you talked about this uh, in the Museum Facing Extension conference uh, already, but some people were not there. Can you give us an example about of one museum who applies future thinking to its practices? Um. Yes, I can, um, but that's also why we brought Katrine. In. So sure. maybe we should save that as a practical example here in a, in, in a, in a minute. Um, but other than that, I will, I'm a, I'm a big fan of museums like Museum of Tomorrow in Rio and Praetorium in Berlin, who are both uh, practicing these things. Um, so, so if you want to explore more, you can, you can go in that direction as well. Thank you very much. We'll have more information about this in a few minutes. Yeah, if anybody has a question, please feel free to jump in. Um, I maybe have one. Yes. I would like to ask you, Nicholas, what is your feeling about those two very kind of polar forces? So one is the colonization, which grows complexity, but we know that a lot of people feel very uncomfortable with the complexity and then they elect the politicians who go for, you know, we will make things very clear and simple and we will give structures. So what is your feeling, you know, how it will work out, like how we will, how can we help each other to embrace this uncertainty and to go this decolonization pathway without those very painful frictions sometimes. First of all, uh, that's a, I wish I could answer that like right on the spot and have a silver bullet to it. Um, because I do think that that is too very, as you say, polarizing thing in society that obviously create more complex situations. Um, but in terms of what museums can do and let their audience embrace more complexity and reflect on, on complicated situations, I think we need to see uh, museums as political institutions as they are, and they need to relate to the current zeitgeist of the political realm. So when people are, when museums are showcasing historical artifacts or future artifacts, they're taking a stand on a current situation. Um, and they need to help people to reflect upon that, to, to give them an opportunity to create their own visions of the future and their own idea of what, uh, what things could be like. I think that's a way to get over the colonization part of things. Um, and in terms of the political realm that you're addressing as well, um, I'm not sure it's my home turf to, uh, to, to, to take that one on. Okay, thank you. So other questions? I didn't follow the chat. Did anything happen here? Let's see, there's some links. How can we make sure that every point of view is expressed and respected? It's a good question. Save that for the breakout, Maxime. I mean, if there's no more questions at this point, I think we should uh, I think we should move on and and maybe feature Katrine. Are you ready, Katrine? Yes, I am. Thank you so much for the invitation and thank you for a brilliant and inspiring talk, Nicholas. Thank you, Katrine. I'm so happy that you were willing to uh, to come and, and join us here today and and uh, and be an example of how futures thinking can be can be done as a practice at an at an art museum. Um, I'm just gonna 
share my screen again, because I know you have a few slides that you would like to talk over. So give me a second. Do you see it? Yes. And can you hear me? Yes, loud and clear. Great. First of all, let me quickly introduce you, Katrina. Is that okay? Yes, that's fine. Great. Thank you. We have reserved 15 minutes of this uh, meetup to listen to and to talk to uh, to Katrina K. Pedersen, who is a who is the head of education and mediation at the Aachen Museum of Modern Art. She's also the founder of Aachen Art and Tech Lab, which is this art museum's uh, outlet for, uh, for, for future thinking and technology exploration with, uh, with the wider audience of the, of the museum. And Katrine, I will beyond say that you are an amazing friend, a uh, brilliant speaker and, and fantastic at what you're doing. Give the word to you and let you tell a little bit about your time at Aachen. Wow, <laughs> I hope I can live up to that. Um, I will begin saying that, um, well, this is, this is our museum. This is Art Museum of Modern Art. It is located in uh, just outside Copenhagen. I don't know if you have been to Copenhagen. Um, it's located in an area with the highest concentration of ethnic minority groups in Denmark. So this is actually not only an art museum, this is very much a museum that is, um, was a, a political um, choice to not only have an art museum is in an area for, for the elite, but also for people who would maybe not meet art in their everyday life. So this is also a social project because we have a lot of uh, vulnerable families and children and young people. Um, futures, it's difficult to predict the futures. Um, however, I think what is very much important, uh, at least from my uh, seat um, as a, a head of education and mediation, it is very important for me to, I mean, to be aware of not only my biases, but also as a museum, as a, an art industry, as, um, as an institution, to be aware of these institutional biases and the structures that defines our choices, our curation, our, and also the way that we meet our audience or participa participa participations. Um, participants, sorry. <laughs> um, and I don't know if you can see the small picture in the in the in the lower left uh, corner, that is actually because we are not only um, in our museum, we are also we also have like a space called Arden Lab. It's actually located in the local shopping center. That is the center of this area. It's not only a shopping center, it's also like a cultural um, it's also like a culture house. It's also a library, and um, our neighbor is uh, Kentucky Fried Chicken, uh, H and M, uh, and other things. So, and it's also a station. So, this is actually the center center of this local area, just outside Copenhagen, where we meet. I mean, there is there's about twenty thousand people entering the shopping center every day. So, of course, we're going to be there, we're going to not only um, welcome people into our museum, it's very important for us that we take actually the art outside of the museum into the local area, into the um, community. I didn't see the question, was it a question? In the chat? No, Anyone? it's just it's just a, a comment. Uh, Diane okay, saying sorry. that uh, she didn't know Arken was a, also a lab and a social place. Okay, <laughs> so so uh, what we have actually been, we see ourselves as a museum, as part of the community, and we see community building and outreach, not only for us to, to, to reach out, but also to, 
to be part of the community and to listen. That is very important. So actually, um, a lot of our collaborations are together with many different kind of, of partners and um, young people, elderly people, elderly homes, um, kindergarten, schools, etc. And that is actually how I would, if I should say that, the, the, that is the best kind of um, to, to kind of take the temperature of how we would, how we can actually in the best way make our future decisions um, uh, very diverse. That is that we are aware of um, the people that are, that are living in the community, that uh, um, not all of them speak Danish, um, not even English. Some of them have, have never been outside that little area. So um, yeah, that is, that is, that is how we kind of, um, it's kind of how we make sure that we are always, um, that we are always aware of, 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 um, of, 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 of the local uh, conversation. And um, maybe we should take the next slide, Nicholas. Sure. And um, I'm so sorry, but our museum is it's very empty right now, but I guess you you um, you understand and it's probably the same with you guys. Um, we are closed right now, but luckily we have these amazing colorful bears that are the Alaskan tourists. It's an art piece by Paolo Pivi. And um, so this is like a, an example of how we see art or contemporary art as a um, as a way to address alternative futures and to as a way to use art to start a conversation about the future and a conversation about alternative futures. So what we uh, do when we have many different audiences and, and um, um, participants at our museum, visiting visitors at a museum, we have different programs and um, what we see, what we experience is that art is actually very inclusive and when we take art as a starting point to look into the future to have conversation about the future it is a very diverse conversation when when just um when we are still open in 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 november a little boy visited the museum and he asked me why are the bears dancing at your museum and then i could ask him yeah, they're dancing. Why do you think? So that's actually a very, it's, it's a very like simple way to listen. And it's a very simple way to have a dialogue and to be, a, to be sure that you have a diverse um, approach to um, obviously um, other people, but also future decisions. So I think that is, that is, um, that is why we, see art as a very important tool to address future literacies but also to to have conversation right now and and um i don't know how much time i have left but maybe we should move on to our art and tech lo technology lab um, we have we have around 10 minutes before we need okay. to go in breakout session so i'm just gonna i'm just gonna ask you a question Katrine, if, uh, Great. Uh, we have here from the chat does it inspire you to create those pop-up spaces of museums outside of your buildings? What does it do when you can like go beyond the brick and mortar of the museum itself? Thank you for, for this awesome question. Um, it's very inspiring. And the reason why it's inspiring is because you can't predict anything. It's just like people will come in and then will, they will ask and then, then they would tell their stories. So it, it kind of, it's, we meet a lot of different people. Some of them, them would say, I hate art. And then that would be, the, the, they, they, they say it because they want to have a conversation because maybe they're lonely, because they, are, they want to provoke or anything. But, uh, and also we, it, 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 it's an opportunity to meet a young audience because they're hanging out just outside Kentucky Fried Chicken. They're going to the cinema and all that. So they will pass and then they will look into and we, we make sure that a lot of the artists that we have, we have an artist in residency pro program at our lab. Um, so we make sure that they are also um, artists that, that would like to have conversations or, or even to co 
create and also to co-curate because that is very important for us to open up and to um, be curious and to be um, um, and to have a, a, a conversation that is not defined by us. Um, so that is why we are at, at the space outside the museum and that is very inspiring indeed. But one thing I think is important is that we just opened the space and then we began to cu curate and invite different artists in, but that was only a starting point. We have been there for two years now, al almost. And, it, and it's very important for me that we have at least three years of research and listening so that it would be like a very like um, organic um, meeting and collaboration so that we are not just, um, yes, sorry. I'm just, I'm just, there's so many good questions coming in. So I'm just gonna like try to get most of them in with maybe Perfect. a little shorter answers so we can make the most of it here. Sorry. <laughs> That's fine. That's fine. We're all excited. Um, Diane is asking, what took you to lead, uh, what took you to lead, uh, what led you to, to do this space? Um, we know it's not easy to think about such things and then to have the direction accepting and supporting it. That's right, that's true. Very, very true. I'll try to make it short. Well, first of all, because there was a, um, there was a space for lease and 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 then also because we have been working with the museum is 25 years now this march um so for 20 years we have been working very much um with outreach and community building so it was very natural for us to not only collaborate and to invite people into our museum but also to be part of the local community in that way and then we thought okay a shopping center that is kind of a culture class right I mean, very commercial and you go there to buy something. And we thought that would be amazing also to explore that and to see what kind of conversation. It's a very different conversation that you would have when you enter a shop to buy some clothes mm -hmm. or when you come to our space. Right. So that is very interesting. So people will come and then they will always feel welcome because everyone is welcome in a shopping center if you're not stealing though. But it's a very welcoming place, right? And that's also what people use it. Like they always feel like they're not alone. So um, sorry, that wasn't short. No, nope, that's great. And I can totally see how that the uh, direction is buying into the potential larger inclusion. There's another great question here, Katrina is saying, how do you keep this dialogue with people at the moment? Hmm. Are you having this dialogue with people right now, now that everything has shut down? And to all of you that are not from Denmark, uh, you should know that earlier this week, um, we had another tightening of regulation. So, and potentially another one coming up tonight. So that will definitely make it a little bit, a, a little bit more difficult to maintain or what? Well, actually not. And that is also, I think that is also, it, it could be a very political answer. It's not supposed to be, but in Denmark, all the cultural institutions are locked down but the shopping centers are not. So you so still have the outlet? Place. Okay. Should we continue to the next slide? Yes. Great. Just a second here. Too many monitors. And these, these slides are, this is, a, this is a program with young people. Uh, at our at our lab, and um, maybe you could scroll uh, to the next. And this is also a group of um, of uh, young people from the um, local community. This was a coding for diversity school, um, and maybe you should take the next photo. And I'll just give you an example of how we work with technology. So now now I'm going to zoom into this very specific area that we have been working with actually for 15 years at our museum uh, art and technology that is something that we are very much um uh, we have uh, expertise in and have developed like of course also like tools for mediation and education but it's also it at our art and, art and tech lab it's um it's more um it's more a lab for explorations it's a more a lab for critical thinking and also a very much uh, 
a space for uh, looking into alternative futures. And we think that it's very important to use technology also in this uh, context, because I mean, um, technology is just, it defines our everyday lives. It defines how we communicate. It defines how we relate to one another. And we use more time with screens and with our loved ones. So, I mean, it's such a huge part of our everyday lives. So what we do, and this is just one example, one of the artists in resident um, is uh, Dries Deporter, a Belgian uh, artist. I'm, I don't know if you're familiar with him. If you're not, please go look at his art. He's amazing. So what we do when we have these different both exhibitions and programs, we use art as a starting point, and then we look at technology and we explore it. We explore the blind spots of technology again to look into how can we how can we define a more diverse and more ethical and more human future within the uh, technological um, development so Dries he had this um, this this um, this class or this session with a, a, a group of young people and they were they were they were going to build a dating app based on browser history so it's obvious that you can't do that. And that is actually the point, that it, it makes you reflect, it makes you ask new questions, it makes you think, okay, so I can only, I can only be like dating someone who is also watching uh, highs on Netflix or, um, or whatever. So how do you actually categorize people when you, when you, um, when let's say it's not only like dating, it's also social media when you're friends and followers, how can you actually, how can a company like Facebook, how can they curate our um, friendships? How can they curate our newsfeed? And how is these hidden structures actually functioning? And how are they affecting our relations, our um, communication, etc. Another one is, is uh, this uh, art project called Nonviews. So this is actually an app that you can install on your smartphone. So when you have it on your smartphone, then you will know you will not see how many followers or how many views. You would actually see how many non-views. And um, that's also a way to use art to just turn it upside down and then to make a new reflection and to 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 um, yeah to to um, to questionize and also to innovate. But that's also a part of it because it makes you um, shed light on the blind spots and then you can actually begin to build new and that's what we're doing and that's also when sorry about that <laughs> the phone the doorbell bell is ringing um so um so that is also what we're doing so after we have these art um these, art, these artists teaching just a second I don't, I don't know if this can get more working from home um, than that. Sorry about that. <laughs> who, who was it? Uh, I think it's my husband. He, he right. just got back from home, uh, back from work, so I had to open the door. Okay. Um, Katrina, just a short comment, just to wrap it up. Would you take this last example that I put on the screen? I'll definitely do that. So one of the one of the things when we take like these. Uh, very mainstream platforms that all of us use, like Google or Facebook and and um, Instagram, Snapchat, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So what we do in our in our lab is to look into again the blind spot and the the, the hidden power structures as well. And I, I I think you're already familiar with this example that when when you Google CEO, then or then the um, this is this is my googling. I think it was a couple of month ago but you could try yourself and then a lot of white men were in a suit with with um, um and and not many women not many people of color um and uh, this this is one a problem that uh, has been called the white algorithmic no the the white the algorithmic algorithmic white guy problem so uh, as i told you we have a lot of um of uh, yeah, people from ethnic minority groups in our area. And one girl, she said to me, okay, so 
do you think that Google actually think that I can't be a CEO just because I'm a Muslim girl or wearing a scarf or of, of, of and, and, and she asked me that question. And then it opened up for a conversation about biases, about um, how technology is not just neutral tools that they are developed by a certain group of people, a very like narrow, um, if you narrow it out, it's actually very simple that Google only trained its algorithm in English. And I mean, there are thousands of languages in the world and we don't really think about these um, cultural problems with our platforms. And um, so that is what we use the art to look into technology in this very, reason, how would you say, like uh, art critical uh, perspectives. Thank you so much, Katrina. Thank you for bringing forward these incredible examples of how art can help us challenge our predisposed ideas of what things are and are not, and help us think beyond the, uh, the current paradigms. I want to open the floor here, um, unless you have a final note, Katrina. No, thank you so much for your time. <laughs> yeah, that's good. Does anybody from the community have any questions that they would like to ask Katrina? I would have one question. Yes. Uh, thank you very much, Catherine. That was very, very interesting. Uh, I think the work that you're doing is really interesting and fascinating. And uh, uh, you talked at the beginning about uh, hearing voices from the public and having comments back from the experiences. How do you make sure that all voices are on the same level and that uh, when you receive these comments, you don't, uh, not you as a person, but the institution doesn't uh, um, make a hierarchy or categorize them uh, in different groups? It is very, very, very important to be aware of that. And first of all, to be aware of the, um, that is, it is very complex and that is, it can't be an intention, but sometimes it's um, unintentionally, it can go wrong in some way, but it's very important for us to be inclusive and um, and I think the way that we do that is to um, to create space for uh, collaborations that start not within our organization but outside in the community, um, and also to give to 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 um, to be brave enough to be brave enough to how would you say to just um, give the mic to pat the mic. And also to open the space and say, okay, it's yours. What would you like to do if if you um, if you were to curate an art exhibition or to have a workshop or how can we use the space? So it's actually also to give this the stage and to give the spaces to uh, and not only to be like in a in a um, one way communication. Okay. Thank you very much. Any other questions to Katrina while we're here? Anyone feeling overlooked from the chat? I'm sure you're watching it closely, Diane. Did we overlook anything? Seems fine. No, I think it's good. Okay. All right. How are you feeling, everyone? Are you up for some breakout discussions on four different topics related to these things that we have been addressing? Ready. Yeah. You look very excited. Let me say that. Is everyone back? Yeah, everyone is back. I just uh, we might we might have lost a few people then. Yeah, we had a few people um, we needed to leave before. All right. I think we can start, huh? Okay, I was just think I was I thought we were waiting for more people. No, 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 right. everyone is back. All right, all right. Well, welcome back, everyone. I hope you had some very interesting discussions. I know it's very short time and a lot of information to process. And also, I think it's very natural for everyone to just like go back in solution mode. How can I take this and apply it right away and then realize all the obstacles oh, yeah. in front of one um, uh, in, in front of you. 
um, which is obviously very natural and, and a part of a, a very healthy um, reflective process. But we, uh, we chose these four different questions. They were narrowed down to three because uh, one group was split up as far as I understand, um, because they were touching upon different topics throughout um, this, uh, this meetup's um, purpose. So since I am, uh, we can start by asking if there's any volunteers that would like to report back on the question or the discussion you had in your group. No volunteers, really? I'd like to volunteer. I just thank I, you, Katrina. <laughs> no, I think it was so interesting, and it was very difficult to start the conversation and to talk about activism because um, what is activism from? I mean, from an organizational uh, perspective, and and can I can I practice activism, or is it only like I mean? As I also said in the group, I'm, I think that contemporary art itself, because it's kind of addressing the taboos and the trends and the time we live in. And um, I think it is activism. So our museum is filled with activism, but it, it took me a while and it was so inspiring to listen to all the examples in our group. Um, and then I got it. And then I also had an example. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Should I share your screen and you can tell us a little bit about what you discussed? Then I can share what you put in the Google slide. Yes, yeah, should I do that or? I'm sharing now and then you and your group could maybe help each other. Um, mm -hmm. Tell us, tell the rest of us what you uh, explored. Katrina, mm -hmm. are you? Are you actually reporting for the group or should I do it? Yeah, well, well yeah you could do that that's fine yeah okay so but you were about to do it no um no <laughs> okay. well it's, wrong. it's fine I, by me okay i saw that you tried to put a visual um i think yeah. you i just made some space in, in the okay side. i'll try to put it in then to add it again, um, you have space to do it. So yeah, at first I think it was quite difficult to understand what kind of activism people, like the question was about it, it was quite, the question is actually really broad. Activism can, can mean a lot of things, can be act, being activist for animals, for the climate, for diversity. Um, so big question about what is activism. <laughs> And then very fast, I think everyone understood that giving a voice um, and, and allowing people to participate is also a beginning of activism. It's actually um, giving a space for people to express themselves and to say loud um, what is not um, normally said. So we had different kind of example. One has been um, about one museum serving as a space for dialogue and mutual understanding um, in Israel called the Museum of the Seam. Uh, then we talk about, like Katrine, um, starting to talk about the fact that with her team, she's um, thinking about inviting people to share testimonies about what's happening now in their daily life and creating this kind of visual collective narrative. Um, and she also said that activism is basically everywhere actually in her museum because activism is through art and art is everywhere in the museum. Um, then we actually went a little bit deeper and understood um, two examples from Lithuania. Um, one is about um, giving the voice to teenagers and the exhibition is called Somewhat Weird Art. It's currently being developed by the National Gallery of Arts in, in Vilnius. And it's basically um, co-creation, -cu co-curation um, exhibition between teenagers and museum curators. And, and what they are talking about is definitely not conventional. <laughs> and then we also talked about fast response collecting, um, which is currently happening at the Nat National Museum of Lithuania, because they are actually asking people to collect objects and stories of, yeah, what's happening today in, a, in, able to, in order to be able to organize an exhibition very soon. 
And then we talked about my music, which is, I suppose, then we, we were cut, I suppose, as well, a participative exhibition. And I think Katrina will add a, a picture very soon. <laughs> <laughs> is it coming? I already added it. I, maybe it's, um, oh, you, maybe you have to update, update the slide. All right. Um, Who would like to present from number three, group three? We agreed that uh, me, Gabriela, will talk about that. And um, the question was how can you make sure to include everyone in the conversation in your museum's programming? Okay, so I hope others will add something just on the go. So first of all, uh, we discussed about uh, the needs of audiences. Uh, we have to find out first uh, what are our audiences and what audiences are absent, uh, which audiences we would like to involve, to invite to the museum. And um, uh, we have to maybe um, look um, at the audience of the museum uh, as uh, not one group, but just to see uh, what are the differences between different small groups inside of our audience. And um, we were discussing the methods, how to make it. So one of them was uh, to use art to start a dialogue. Um, for example, uh, uh, to create a workshop and invite people to participate in it. And uh, maybe also to go out outside of the building of the museum, to schools, to shopping center, to maybe the some square in the city. And uh, we also were thinking about experiment um, to create a museum board uh, with people from different uh, small groups, uh, for example, immigrants, foreigners, kids, uh, senior people. It's a great idea. And, and sometimes, you know, uh, to share some ideas with them, to ask for their opinion. And of course we have to um, time after time um, um, have discussion with our board. And also to create a diverse for program for diverse audiences. Maybe Agla could um, talk about it more because my idea was like, if we have an exhibition um, to create maybe two or three different education programs. But I think her idea was different. So maybe Agla, you could comment more on this. Well, I just uh, made a comment then that uh, if you talk about, for example, school children, you cannot say school children is a, a target group because there are first grades, then there are 12 grades, then there are those who are interested in art, those who are interested in sports, or any other group group of people is maybe not a group from which seems from the first sight. So we have to be very specific. And I think that if you want to uh, involve more audiences, you don't have to do that with uh, one exhibition. Maybe one exhibition is more you can work with some groups, then with other exhibition, with other groups, and this is maybe a way to involve a wider range of people. Thank you. Thank you for, for this very rich response here. Um, that was, uh, was very interesting. I really like the, uh, the museum board idea. Uh, mindful of time, we uh, fast backward here to uh, group two. 
And Janiers, would you help me? Uh, go ahead. Maybe I'm, you know, not right. feeling like, like talking very much today. But... Okay, that's all right. Well, obviously, we had a very difficult question in terms of decolonization and what it even means. So we spent some time discussing does it essentially mean to make sure that what you invite people to participate in, to see and watch, um, that it is opening up for alternatives so people can reflect themselves uh, rather than giving people uh, a, an answer right away so that you are not planting a seed in people's head, but people have the opportunity to reflect themselves. Um, and then we were also discussing a little bit how museums um, in general can facilitate platforms, as it says here, where guests can become participants rather than passive spectators. So they have more agency in, in the experience that they take away with them from the museums. Um, let people ask questions, but also understanding that the context that Lithuanian museums are working into uh, is a more of an old fashioned way it was announced. Um, which leaves a lot of space for, for more inclusivity and diversity in, in, in what is being put forward. And um, to prepare, and then it says to prepare a team of the museum to be able to answer questions, to be prepared to hear the questions and to understand them. Now, final comment would be on the picture from your end, Janus. So basically uh, what, how, what, what, what's shown here is uh, as Nicholas mentioned, uh, not planting the seeds. So uh, we want to kind of uh, go away from the visuals as, you know, as, as a museum, we want to give a, uh, for the visitors a chance to give their own opinion on the labels, you know, that are around us, for example, the same CEO, you know, it's not an artistic uh, example right now, but just something, you know, to, for you to make a connection. So we want uh, to suggest a space where people could, you know, interpret, you know, our their own terms and suggest something they want to uh, to the words that they see. And in this way, we was we would support some some kind of a change, and you know, not being stuck on, uh, you know, on this kind of, yeah, not being stuck on on small questions. Let's say so. Thank you. Mindful of time, I know we're supposed to end here five thirty. I hope you have had a interesting afternoon and we have one last thing that we uh, would like to ask from you before you leave. Um, so if you can just give me a second here. I'm just gonna share my screen again and then you can, um, just answer the question at your own pace in the chat. We would like you to consider this final takeaway of today. How can your museum facilitate broader participation in futures thinking? We don't, we got, we, we are going to wrap up quickly. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Nicholas, for today. Thank you, Catherine for joining us and for being with us. And thank you everyone for joining and participating. Oh, we have some comments coming out, coming it's in. Coming. And uh, we have our next meetup in, uh, in January. So if uh, you are interested, it's on the 14th of January with Cara Courage and you have all the information on the online community. Thank you all. Thanks for having us. Hope you had a good afternoon. Thank you. Yes, thank you very, thank you very much, everyone, and hope to see you soon online. Thank you. Have a good evening.